This is part two of the Spirit Walker, Tessa Lamar novels, book four. Written by Katherine M. Hurst. Narrated by Holly Adams. Be sure to subscribe to Katherine's channel where you can find part three of this audiobook, along with more of Katherine's paranormal and contemporary romance novels. Chapter 11 To appease my overprotective husbands and daughter, I spent the rest of the morning in bed. It had sounded like a grand idea at the time, but there was one problem. I couldn't sleep. Three hours of googling monsters who steal human skin later, I gave up. Mostly, I'd found lists of creatures from Dungeons and Dragons, but I followed the path down the rabbit hole anyway. I figured whoever created the imaginary beasts might have based them on something tangible. I was wrong. My searches produced absolutely freaking lutely nothing useful, unless Lulu was a seal shapeshifter called a selkie. Considering we lived in Florida, that was highly unlikely. The internet also got it all wrong about skinwalkers. I'd dealt with one of those before, and I didn't want to again. Just for fun, I looked up Nunahi. Oddly enough, most of the information hit a little closer to home than I would have liked. Aaron eased the bedroom door open and peeked inside. How are you holding up? The situation with Lulu was intense. I'm okay, I guess. No one deserves to die the way she did. But at least I'm not holding my breath waiting to see who's going to die. There's that. He shifted his weight from one foot to the other, a sure sign the topic made him uncomfortable. Did you get any rest? Nope, but I can name the top ten most terrifying mythological creatures of all time. I tossed my phone aside. And none of them skin humans alive. He grimaced. You shouldn't be reading that stuff. It's, I narrowed my eyes. So help me. If you tell me it's not good for the baby, I'll strangle you. Then we'll have a conversation about how it's not good for the baby to be born in prison. He scratched the side of his head. I was going to say, it'll give you nightmares. I drew a calming breath in hopes of settling my key or aligning my chakras, but all it did was remind me I hadn't eaten in hours and I had to pee. How's TJ? The same as the rest of us. Scared, confused. Isn't that the truth? I motioned for him to come closer. How much does he know? Aaron stretched out beside me. For now, he thinks there was a monster in the house. We thought it best to wait until you woke up to tell him about his parents. Gee, thanks. I rolled to my side and rested my head on his shoulder. He ran his hand through the length of my hair. You are licensed to handle this sort of thing. Yes, but I worked with adults, not kids. I paused, dreading the answer to my next question. What about Grandma and Dottie? Did you guys tell them? He dipped his chin. Only the basics. No details. My throat tightened. I can't do this. It'll be okay. You did a great job with Jojo when she first came to us. I know, but this is different. My eyelids drooped. Something about him playing with my hair always put me to sleep. Besides, an actual nap would buy me time before I had to answer questions about Lulu's murder. Did Brasson find out anything else about your apparent dream walking? Not yet. We've been busy dealing with other crises. We'll figure it out. I tried to sound reassuring, to smile, to hide my concern, but it felt like a lie. Too much had happened too fast for us to play games. I hope. He said he'd make some calls once things calmed down. If things calmed down. Is he still upset with me? Aaron's hands stilled. Yes but he understands why you did it. Frowning, I lifted my head. Do you? I'm torn. I'd rather you sent Lulu and the evil spirit far from here. But I want justice for Tank. 
He kissed the tip of my nose. And I'd like to make sure whatever killed her doesn't hurt anyone else. I'd planned to wait to bring up my concerns until Bryson joined us, but I needed answers. Aaron, in your dream, did the thing that killed Lulu see you? He tensed. Why? I wanted to tell him never mind, blame my fear on soon-to-be mom Itis, and talk about happy things like baby clothes and maternity leave. Unfortunately, I had two problems. Now that I'd mentioned it, he wouldn't let it go. Second, we had kids to think about. We needed to do a danger assessment. I'd rather not be caught off guard if a skin-stealing monster comes calling. He pulled me tighter. Listen to me. It was a dream. Yes, I may have astral projected or dream walked or whatever you want to call it, but it was just a dream. I'm not so sure about that. Brasson stood in the doorframe with his arms folded. You witnessed events that were happening in the physical world. Real events. You're saying the thing that killed Lulu will come after me? Aaron swallowed hard. Maybe. Maybe not. He walked into the room and sank into a chair near the bed. I'm not going to wait and find out. I pushed myself upright. We'll start with the wards. Brasson nodded, but I could tell by the way he stared out the window he didn't believe they'd be enough. My heart sped. What else can we do? Wards will stop any man monster or spirit who wishes to do us harm from setting foot on the property. But they are no help if something enters from the spirit realm. I fear they would trap the beings inside with us. Now there's a lovely thought. The memory of Jolene tearing the veil crossed my mind. Not that I thought for a second she had anything to do with what had happened. However, if a little girl could wield that much power... Others could, too. I must have looked shaken because the men sandwiched me between their big bodies. I sensed them having a nonverbal conversation above my head, but for once, I didn't care. Bryson was right. I should have sent Lulu and her evil hitchhiker to the Shadowlands. I'm shaping up to be a horrible mother. Babe. Bryson captured my chin between his thumb and index finger and lifted my face until he met my gaze. We'll protect you and the kids. I oh, know, it's just... I sighed. I feel so damned helpless. I hadn't realized how much I'd come to depend on magic. Depend on us instead. Aaron nuzzled against my hair as if scent marking me. I do. I mean, I am... I couldn't help but grin. You're not feeling the need to shift into a bird, are you? His brows climbed into his hairline. No. Why? Bryson chuckled. You rubbed your face on her hair. So? She smells like strawberries and sex. His voice lowered. And I freaking love strawberries. It was Bryson's turn to look surprised. It's something animals, shifters, and Nunehi do with their mates. Aaron smirked. I'll let you know if I have the urge to sprout fur or feathers. This new behavior may have something to do with you coming into your powers. Bryson clamped his hand on Aaron's shoulder. If so, your emotions may become more intense. Think of it as magic puberty. Great. Frowning, he glanced at me before turning back to Bryson. Hold on a sec. Is that why Tessa was so out of control when she first shifted? Uh-uh. Don't say another word. We're not going there. I waved my hand as if to wipe their thoughts away. How do we put up wards to protect us from bad guys in the spirit world? They exchanged glances, but neither answered. I bit back a groan. While I had no proof, I'd bet my right thumb they'd had a lengthy conversation after sending me to bed like a toddler. Judging by their expressions, 
I'd bet my left thumb they'd come up with a plan. A plan I wouldn't like. You might as well spill it. I know you two are up to something. Aaron opened his mouth as if to speak, but Bryson shook his head. I motioned between them. One of you had better start talking. Bryson pressed his lips into a tight line and looked away. I'm not able to protect us from that sort of attack. You're far more gifted than I am when it comes to spirits. We're doomed. I can't do a simple summoning spell without needing a nap. There's no way I can weave wards. I can work with Jolene. She's able to manipulate the veil. It makes sense she could strengthen it, Bryson said. Aaron took my hand. She's our best shot. I stared for several heartbeats. They can't be serious, can they? It had taken months to train her to block the constant barrage of spirits whispering in her head. She finally had a shot at a normal life. I wouldn't allow her to get sucked back into the otherworldly mumbo-jumbo. No. We'll find another way. There isn't time. Bryson finally met my gaze. The pain in his eyes made me wish he'd kept staring at the floor. No, she's just a kid. This is a grown-up problem. The grown-ups will fix it. Aaron sighed. We don't like this any more than you do, but I'd heard enough. I said no. I'm keeping her as far away from this as possible. We are not going to have our daughter go up against a skin-thieving monster. Brasson held his hands up. No one said anything about her getting anywhere near a murderer. Right, but you can't guarantee her safety. I turned to Aaron. Last night, when we thought we lost you, she tore a hole in the veil between this world and the next. She's powerful, too powerful. That kind of magic is like a homing beacon, Lord knows what she'll attract if she spell casts in the spirit world. The color drained from his face. Tessa, think about it. Twice now she's understood the situation better than the three of us, Bryson said. He had a point. A weak one, but valid nonetheless. The girl had known Aaron was still alive and that Lulu wasn't in control of her spirit. I still don't like it. His voice softened. Neither do I. But what choice do we have? I can't do it. I was the last to see the spirit. Hell, TJ saw her before I did. I'll call to Charlie and Achila. They can help me put up the wards. If the spirits of two full-blooded Nunahi couldn't help us, I highly doubted anyone could. I don't want you anywhere near this. Lulu and the dark spirit were able to touch the baby in your womb. My maternal instinct kicked into hyperdrive, and I'm not going to endanger one child for the sake of another. The men exchanged glances, but neither spoke. I'm summoning Charlie, end of discussion. I'd planned to storm out, but the squirming and grunting it took to stand ruined the effect. Chapter 12 I regretted walking outside the second the door closed behind me. Grand May had called in reinforcements to help clean up the party mess. My mother and stepfather loaded folding chairs into the back of Stone's van, and a handful of cousins were taken down tents. Jolene and TJ, each with a large trash bag, wandered the yard searching for leftover cups and bottles and scraps of paper. Much to my surprise, the kids both wore huge grins. They seemed to have made a game out of garbage duty. I wonder if Grand May bribed them with leftover birthday cake. The mere thought of a sweet treat made my stomach growl. Darlene flashed me a blinding smile and marched over like a woman with an agenda. Unfortunately for me, I had a good idea which items she wanted to discuss. I hurried down the porch steps and met her halfway between my house and Grand May's. 
If I had to explain why I hadn't summoned Ezekiel Clemens' spirit, I planned to do it over a glass of sweet tea and a plate full of carbs. Where do you think you're going, young lady? Stopping in front of me, she planted her hands on her hips. Oh, boy. She's in rare form. I had two choices, add to her bad mood or listen to her go on and on about finding the stolen money. As tempting as aggravating her was, it would result in delaying my brunch. I decided to play nice. To scrounge up some food, want to join me? Darlene blinked. Twice. Evidently, my invitation surprised her. I'd like that. You and I have some things to discuss. Mama, I told you I'd try to reach out to old man Clemens. I just haven't had time. She waved her hand as if batting away a horsefly. That's not important right now. I glanced at the kids. She was right. We had more pressing matters to address. Let's go inside. We walked into Grandma's kitchen and into what I can only describe as a war room. My great-grandmother and Dottie sat at the kitchen table going through a mountain of file folders, envelopes, and old address books. What's all this? Not one to let a little thing like a cluttered table keep me from food, I headed straight for the fridge. Dottie said, Somewhere in this mess is Lulu Rose's aunt and uncle's phone number and address. And Tank's will. Grandma shifted her dentures around. That stopped me for two reasons. One, Tank didn't seem like the plan ahead type, and two, he wasn't dead. Darlene saved me the trouble of asking, Why on earth do you need his will? He and Lulu left the boy to me. I figured the lawyer would need it, Grandma said. The room swayed, and I leaned against the counter for support. With Lulu dead and Tank in custody, they were planning for the worst-case scenario. TJ becoming an orphan. Was there a judge in the world who'd award custody of a little boy to an 86-year-old woman? Grandma, TJ is a wildling. I'll take him in if it comes to it. I hoped I hadn't spoken out of turn, but I couldn't see her raising the little devil. That might be best. She smiled, but it didn't warm her eyes. If anything, it told me how much the situation wore on her. Darlene lowered her voice. Do you think Tank did it? No, Grandma, Dottie, and I said in unison. All I'm saying is we should consider the possibility. You saw the way Tank Man handled her. My mother turned to me as if looking for backup. I had no intention of telling Darlene or anyone the details of Lulu's murder. Heck, as far as I was concerned, they didn't need to know Aaron and I had visited the crime scene. Could I keep it a secret? Should I? Oh, my Lord in heaven, you know something! Darlene pinned me with her gaze. To lie or not to lie? Was that even a question? Graham May could smell dishonesty like a bloodhound tracking a duck. I'm not at liberty to discuss the details of an active investigation. To my surprise, my mother fell silent and Graham May narrowed her eyes. Dottie seemed to ponder the situation for a long moment before turning to me. We aren't being nosy. We're trying to do what's best for TJ. Dang it. How can I argue with that? We've been calling the jail all morning, but no one can tell us when Tank will be arraigned. Plus, we have to start thinking about arrangements. She pulled her reading glasses off and set them aside. There must be some things you can share with us. I copped out and went with the easy topic first. Won't Lulu's people want to plan her funeral? She was raised in foster care. Darlene dipped her chin. She didn't have any close family, only an aunt and uncle in West Virginia. How did I not know that? I glanced between them. Tank isn't in jail. 
He's being held for a psychiatric evaluation. Grand May clutched the little gold cross she wore around her neck. That poor man. My heart broke for her. I couldn't just stand there. I was hardwired to do or say something to comfort her. He was pretty shaken up, but he'll get through this. I have no doubt in my mind he's innocent. She kept a death grip on her necklace and nodded. Darlene made a tisking sound. I can't imagine finding Stone's body, or worse, witnessing his murder. She met my gaze. That's it, right? He saw her die and lost his marbles? I closed my eyes and prayed for divine intervention. When none came, I said, I can't talk about the case, but we should decide what we're going to tell TJ. Graham May swallowed hard. He knows his mama's gone. Aaron said you all saw her spirit last night. It wasn't exactly a normal ghost. I had no earthly idea how to explain the evil hitchhiker or what had actually happened in my living room, nor did I want to get into it in front of my mother. We weren't sure what we saw. Jojo told TJ it was a monster, and we left it at that. Dottie's eyes widened. That's what the boy meant. We thought he was angry and calling Lulu names. If the shoe fits. Breakfast all but forgotten, I pulled out a chair and sat. Until we know exactly who or what paid us a visit, it's best we avoid the topic with TJ. The situation is going to be hard enough without him worrying about being haunted. Fine by me. Grandma's spine stiffened. Unless you think we have something to worry about. Bryson and I have it under control. At least I hoped we did. I couldn't get into my plan to summon Charlie or Jolene's potential involvement with them. They had enough to worry about without adding attack spirits, the danger to my baby, and rips in the veil to the list. My great-grandmother studied my expression as if trying to read my mind. Whatever she'd seen must have satisfied her, because her shoulders relaxed. I think it's best you speak to T.J. You have training in this sort of thing. You're not the first person to suggest that. I wanted to bang my head on the kitchen table, but it was covered with papers. I glanced between Darlene and Dottie. Are y'all comfortable following my lead with TJ? They nodded. No matter what, we stick to whatever is said in this room. I locked eyes with my mother. No embellishments. No speculation. She smirked. I'm not stupid, Tessa Marie. I forced a smile and motioned to the door. Could you call him and Jolene inside? Dottie set her hand on mine. Is it a good idea to have this talk in front of Jojo? It wasn't that long ago she lost her mama. They're best friends, and he's going to need all the support he can get. I sent up a silent prayer that Jolene wouldn't contradict me or say anything more about the ghosts. Darlene stuck her head out the door and hollered for the kids. The tone of her voice made me grind my teeth. She'd use the same shrill pitch to call my name when I was little. It usually meant I was in trouble and about to get a whooping. The kids must have thought the same thing. They came through the door with their heads down and shoulders slumped. Grandma stood. Why don't you two go wash your hands? Then we'll all go in the living room and talk. I saw their dirt-crusted fingers as an opportunity. TJ, you go first. The boy glanced from me to Jolene and back. Yes, ma'am. Jojo gave me a knowing look and walked to my side. It's time to tell him, right? Yes. Are you okay with being here for this? 
I leaned close and drew in the scent of strawberry shampoo and earth from her hair. She might not have come from my body, but she was my daughter through and through. The girl nodded. We aren't going to talk about the spirits, okay? She sighed. Good luck. He won't stop asking about them. One thing at a time. I understood where the kid was coming from. I'd seen ghosts most of my life and still hadn't quite gotten used to them. But this was different. This was his mother. We'll have another talk with him later. TJ came out of the bathroom, dripping grayish water all over Grandma's clean floor. Are we in trouble? We didn't mean to break open the trash bag. Dottie handed the child a dishcloth. You're not in trouble. I nodded for Jolene to wash up. TJ stared after her before turning back to me. Are we going to talk about the monster? I had graduate training, a license in mental health counseling, and experience helping JoJo recover after losing her mother. Yet I froze. I'd rather you talk about that when I'm not around. All this boogeyman nonsense is going to give me nightmares. Grandma picked up the telephone. The boy shuddered. Yes, ma'am. His reaction told me we couldn't put off the conversation forever. Sooner or later, we'd have to explain what he'd seen, which meant we needed to understand what the heck was going on. Who are you calling? Grandma said, since this is a family meeting, Bryson and Aaron should be here. TJ flashed her a toothless grin. Call my mama and daddy, too. Chapter 13 Five adults and two children in Grandma's dinky living room was probably a fire hazard, but flames were the least of our problems. I couldn't shake the feeling that someone or something else had joined us. I met Jolene's gaze several times in hopes she'd give me a clue about the cause of the sensation of pressure at the base of my neck. No such luck. If she sensed anything was amiss, she didn't let on. Grandma sat in her easy chair with TJ perched in the spot he'd claimed as a toddler, her footstool. Seeming to want to stay close to the boy, Jolene plopped down beside them. I ran a nervous hand over my swollen belly as I joined Dottie and Darlene on the sofa. Brasson and Aaron stood shoulder to shoulder in the doorframe like bouncers at a nightclub, Neither man looked overly thrilled to be in the room, but few people could refuse Grandma. Part of me wanted to tell them to sit, but that would involve a game of musical chairs. Instead, I blurted out, TJ, we have some news about your parents. He turned his sweet face toward me and smiled. I couldn't help but wonder if it would be his last for a while. Is Daddy coming to pick me up today? No, honey, he's not. I chose my next words carefully. Conventional wisdom said to keep things simple, honest, and answer any questions when speaking to a young child about death. However, TJ wasn't your typical second grader, and this wasn't your typical death. Your mama died last night. The adults in the room took a collective breath, as if waiting for the boy to cry or scream or ask a million questions. TJ did none of those things. He wiped his nose on the back of his hand and nodded. I waited for what seemed like an eternity before I continued. Your daddy will be here as soon as he can, but he has to. That got TJ's attention more than the news he'd lost his mom. He sat up straighter and looked me in the eye. Yeah, I know. You know what? I glanced at Bryson and Aaron before turning back to the boy. He's in jail. TJ hitched a shoulder. Mama said he's helping to find the person who hurt her. Then the monster came and scared her off. 
My brain screeched to a halt. Why did you ask if he was coming today? I prayed real hard that Mama was telling one of her stories. You know, when she did something bad and didn't want Daddy to know. His voice grew smaller with each word until I had to strain to hear him. Dottie gasped, and Grandma pressed her hand to her chest. Darlene leaned close to me and whispered, Is he a channel too? I ignored her and focused on TJ. I'm sorry, sweetheart. I don't want you to worry. You're safe here with us. We're going to take care of you. Will Mama come back? Are we going to call her? I'd prepared myself for this question. When a person dies, their body stops working. They can't be here with us like they used to, but sometimes their spirit comes to visit. Jolene took his hand. People like me and Tessa can see them, but most folks can feel them if they pay attention. I saw my mama. Am I like you? Jolene widened her eyes and glanced at me. I don't think so. Your mom loved you so much, she couldn't leave without seeing you one more time. Thanks. The boy startled, but then hung his head as if receiving a lecture. TJ, are you all right? The pressure at the base of my neck intensified, but try as I might, I couldn't sense any spirits in the room. He didn't respond. The mood had gone from a somber kind of tension to the what-the-hell kind of anxious. The last thing I wanted to do was to ask Jojo if we had any visitors, but what choice did I have? Before I could open my mouth, the girl turned toward me, smiled, and nodded toward the ceiling. Her expression confused me. We'd trapped Lulu Rose and the evil hitchhiker in a bottle, but clearly someone else had paid us a visit. I eased to the edge of the sofa just in case I needed to move quickly. TJ, is someone talking to you now? He sniffled once, wiped both eyes on the back of his hand, and nodded. Bryson and Aaron stood taller, hands at their sides feet further apart, like two fighters waiting for the bell to ring. I lowered my voice in an effort to diffuse the tension. Who are you talking to? She says she's your mother. Brow furrowed, the boy looked from me to Darlene and back. The room went still, as if the walls held their breath along with the rest of us. I'd debated the merits of having the, oh, by the way, you're not my real mom conversation with Darlene for over a year, but decided no good would come from it. Sometimes the truth was as dangerous as landmine peppered quicksand in a jungle full of anacondas. Achila, my birth mother, had died shortly after bringing me into the world. Coincidentally, Darlene's newborn daughter passed away a few weeks before. In a moment of insanity or great insight, Charlie used a magic mind eraser spell to convince Darlene I was hers. The result? I grew up believing I was human, but I'd always felt like a canary being raised by a mountain lion. Well, that's not right, Darlene scoffed. Once again, T.J. shrugged. She looks like Tessa. I needed to take control of the situation and fast. Rather than argue or discount what he'd said, I plastered on a smile and made my way to the boy. Wrapping him in my arms, I said, We can't replace your mom and dad, but we love you very much. Wearing an expression somewhere between embarrassed and grossed out, he wiggled free of my embrace. Can Jojo and I go outside and play now? Sure. No one moved a muscle until the screen door slammed shut behind the kids. Once they were out of earshot, it felt like the house itself exhaled a breath. He seems to be doing okay, 
but it's important to understand that children TJ's age experience grief differently than adults. They can be fine one minute and acting out or sad the next. Grandma tilted her head and stared as if she didn't quite recognize me. Feeling self-conscious, I dipped my chin. A slow smile spread across her face. You did real good, Tessa. Dottie nodded in agreement. It wasn't until I noticed the men's reactions that I remembered I had a big problem. Aaron scratched his jaw, and Bryson continued to watch the goings-on with a grim expression. Are none of you freaked out by what just happened? Pale-faced, Darlene sat straight as a board and wrung her hands. Everyone turned back to me. I didn't see or hear a ghost. It's probably his way of dealing with his grief. You know, imagining people with two mothers. I mean, if I can have two, so can he, right? My laughter came out a shade past hysterical. I think it's time we were honest. Aunt Dottie reached over and patted Darlene's hand. This is going to be difficult for you to hear. Now? You all want to do this now? A lightning bolt of fear shot through me. I struggled to remember how to breathe, let alone speak. The floor seemed to shift beneath my feet. Thankfully, Bryson caught me before I fell. Grand May tightened her grip on the arms of her chair, but I couldn't tell if she planned to defend me or retreat. Holding me close, he murmured, It's as good a time as any. No, this isn't the time. It'll only hurt. Darlene let out a high-pitched, tittering laugh that mirrored my own. I don't know what y'all are talking about, but you're making me nervous. Bryson eased back enough to meet my gaze. His right brow rose as if asking my permission to speak. I closed my eyes and nodded. This is going to be bad. Very bad. Tessa and I are different than the rest of you. He spoke in his usual tone, but his voice felt sweet and slick, like warm syrup. It took me a minute to realize Bryson laced the words with magic. I focused on the subtle shift of energy in the room and gasped. His intentions weren't to calm her down, but to lower her defenses enough for her to hear his message. I'd never seen him do this sort of thing, and Lord knew it would have come in handy more than a few times in our early days together. Darlene simply nodded. Bryson continued. We are Nunahi. Do you know what that is? They are fairy folk, right? Yes. Bryson released me and moved to Darlene. You are every bit Tessa's mother, but you are not the one who bore her. With the help of his magic, she seemed to take the news in stride, whereas I wanted to puke or faint or go into labor, anything to put an end to the conversation. Aaron must have sensed my distress because he draped his arm across my shoulders and kissed my cheek. It's going to be okay. I hope so. I couldn't look away from her. She never had much of a poker face, but with Bryson's magic stripping away her natural defense mechanisms, I could almost see the pieces of the puzzle falling into place. But I had a daughter. She glanced at me for a heartbeat. Your child passed into the spirit realm weeks before Tessa was born. Bryson took Darlene's hand. After Tessa's birth mother died, Charlie gave her daughter to you to raise. Tension creased the corners of Darlene's eyes. Why? I can't speak for him, but I suspect his reasons were twofold. To heal your broken heart and to protect Tessa from those who would try to harm her. He turned to Dottie as if asking for confirmation. The older woman nodded. Charlie was worried about both of you. It might be hard to understand, but he did what he thought was best. 
I had mixed feelings about the entire ordeal, especially his decision to keep the truth from me for so long, but I kept my mouth shut. Darlene raised a trembling hand to her mouth. Y'all knew this all along and never told me? Grandma's frown deepened the crepe paper creases of her face. Daddy and I knew, but Tessa only found out after Charlie died. My mother stared at her hands. She stayed quiet so long, I fought the urge to fill the silence, to go to her, to beg her not to let this change our relationship. We'd only recently stopped fighting long enough to bond. If I lost her now, Darlene met my gaze. I don't care. You always have been and always will be my baby girl. I let out a choked sob. I love you, Mama. I love you, too, even if you aren't human. Her eyes widened. That time you rescued Stone and me from the serial killer. You didn't have a blowtorch, did you? Laughing through tears, I said, no, I used my magic to cut through the metal wall. I knew it. She shot to her feet and pulled me from Aaron's arms. This is wonderful news, don't you see? People will line up for miles to see a real-life fairy. Bryson made a sound deep in his throat. If I didn't do something to change the trajectory of the conversation, he'd bespell my mother into forgetting her own name, let alone my origin. We can't tell anyone. Charlie was right to keep me hidden. There are people out there who would hunt me to the ends of the earth to steal my magic. Of course we won't tell anyone you're a Nunahi. Most folks haven't ever heard the word Nunahi, let alone know the stories about them. I nodded, though I disagreed. A few people did know, and they posted all sorts of articles about Cherokee fairies. She tapped her lips. We'll call you a wizard. No, a witch. Wizards are male. My mouth fell open. Don't look so surprised, Tessa Marie. She smirked. I've seen the Harry Potter movies. Movies, not the books. Figures. I knew I'd live to regret Darlene learning the truth the second Dottie had opened her big mouth. Sure, they all meant well. But none of them understood Darlene like I did. She'd have me making YouTube videos wearing a pointy hat and striped tights by the end of the week. Chapter 14 After the day from hell, Grandma and Aunt Dottie took pity on me. Not only had they sent me home with enough leftovers to feed a professional football team, they'd offered to keep an eye on the kids while Bryson, Aaron, and I took care of business. The first items on our agenda were supper and research. Aaron made a sandwich and called the station to get the scoop on the case against Tank. Brasson took his food into our office and reached out to his network of medicine men and other human magic users. I took advantage of my alone time by polishing off a second plate of smoked chicken and macaroni salad while Googling everything from monsters to custody cases involving incarcerated parents. Bryson returned to the kitchen and sank into the chair beside me. No luck? One glance at his tense shoulders and hard-set jaw told me the answer, but I didn't know what else to say. Nothing useful. He motioned to the laptop. You? I turned the computer toward him. Establishing temporary legal guardianship of TJ seems straightforward enough. I'll need to have Tank sign off on my petition. Otherwise, it's much simpler than what we went through with Jolene. Good. It took him a second or two to realize what I'd said. Your petition? I think I should be the one. Grandma is getting up in years, and we have more space. Plus, Jojo and TJ are close. Bryson rested his hand on my belly as if to remind me we'd soon need the extra room for a nursery. We have a lot going on. 
Tink will get out soon. If not soon enough, then Quinn can bunk in our room for the first month or so. I love TJ, but he's a handful. Are you sure we can handle him, a newborn, and all our other responsibilities? Before you answer that, I have some information, Aaron said from the doorway. As it stands now, there's zero evidence of an intruder. Besides tanks, there were no fingerprints or DNA in the trailer or on Lulu's body. It's only been 24 hours. There's no way CSI finished processing the scene. I refused to accept the killer or monster or spirit or whatever the hell that thing was would get away with murder. Nor would I sit by and watch Tank spend the rest of his life behind bars. No, but it's not looking good. There wasn't as much as a stray hair. Aaron hung his head. Bryson rested his hand on my cheek and turned my face toward his. Babe, I know this is hard, but we need to plan for the worst. Fine. All the more reason for us to raise TJ instead of Grand Mayor Dottie. It seemed like we'd just had this conversation about Jolene, only this time I highly doubted one of my husbands was secretly TJ's daddy. I'm all for it. Aaron pulled a chair out, turned it backward, and straddled it. He's a hellion, but I'm up for the challenge. Bryson glanced between us and sighed. I'll agree on one condition. Oh, boy. Here we go. I braced myself for him to insist we move to a bigger house or the mountains or Timbuktu. We stopped seeing members of the tribe here. I'll speak to Buck Oldham about making space for us to work out of the tribal house in Geneva. He met my gaze. And I want you to extend your maternity leave to six months. What? I'd heard the expression seen read a million times, but I'd always thought it was impossible. Until then. You want me to stay here? By myself? With three kids? For six months? Aaron eased back as if to put as much distance between himself and the crazy pregnant lady as possible. I'd prefer a year, but I'm willing to compromise. The big jerk had the audacity to grin. I turned to Aaron. You realize he's talking about keeping me off murder investigations, right? You have nothing to say about this? He winced and ran his hand over the back of his neck. I think he has a point. You're both taking leave when the baby comes. Why don't we all stay home for half a year? I pushed my chair back so I could see both of them at the same time. Bryson folded his arms. My goal is to keep everyone safe. The best way to do that is to stop the flow of strangers onto the property. Last time we tried to close up shop, people came out of the woodwork to find us. He was right, but dang it, I didn't like it. Not one bit. Aaron offered a slight smile. I'll talk to the chief. I'm not sure he'll approve six months, but I believe I'm entitled to three. It's not a punishment. It's what's best for the kids, all of the kids. Brasson turned toward me. If Tank is convicted, TJ's going to need a stable home. We can't give it to him if the three of us are on call 24-7. As much as I wanted to, I couldn't argue with his logic. However, I could argue with his plan. I'm willing to take the full 12 weeks leave and work part-time for the first year, if... Go on. A hint of a smile ghosted his lips, and I knew I had him. I made a show of pressing my fist into my lower back as I stood. Sure, it was a dirty trick, but I needed all the advantages I could get. If you're willing to do the same. Tessa... People don't get sick on a schedule. Bryson glanced at Aaron, who had the good sense to stay quiet. And people pencil in their murders? I closed the laptop in hopes they'd take the hint and end the conversation. Instead, they resorted to their secret man language. 
when they'd finished their private chat, they nodded. Honestly, living with you two is worse than living with twins. Aaron flashed me a full-blown grin that told me I wouldn't like whatever came out of Bryson's mouth next. I'll agree to working every other day and the occasional Saturday, if you promise to stay away from active crime scenes. Bryson used the same tone as he had with Darlene, except he didn't add in magic. I went from seeing red to magenta with streaks of purple. You can't be serious, Aaron said. I agree with Bryson. We've taken too many unnecessary risks. There's no reason you can't visit the scene once it's cleared and read the evidence at the station. I picked up my empty plate, turned on my heel, and marched to the sink. No reason at all except my official title is victim's advocate. Visiting family members at the scene is in the job description. Not exactly. Aaron waited until I turned around before he continued. You don't have to go inside the perimeter of an active investigation. I waffled between wanting to throw something at them and wanting to cry. I'd worked my tail off to establish some semblance of credibility in the police department. I believed they had my best interests at heart, but that didn't soften the blow to my ego. I mean, why was it always the woman's responsibility to sacrifice her career and raise the kids? Bryson stood and kissed my cheek. We don't need to decide anything now. Why don't we sleep on it for a couple of nights? Though the clock read seven in the evening, I was exhausted. Pregnancy had done more than make me look like I'd swallowed a beach ball. It had made me a world-class napper. I think I'm going to get started on that right now. But I'm not going to change my mind about crime scenes. He smiled his we'll see smile. Aaron, likely seeing an opportunity, seized it. This is about as close as we've come to an argument. Mind if I join you? My heart did a somersault. I think some makeup nookie is in order, but we better hurry. Grand May will send the kids home in an hour or so. In that case, I'm coming too. Bryson took my hand and led me to the bedroom. We better hurry. Chapter 15 I woke to heavy breathing and soft moans. For a split second, I thought the guys had decided to have a little sexy time while I slept, but that didn't add up. Despite some curiosity early on, they'd decided they were more comfy fooling around with me in the middle. I stared, blurry-eyed, at the empty spot on Bryson's side of the bed. He must have gone back to work once I'd drifted off. The bed moved behind me, and Aaron muttered something in his sleep. My throat went dry. I tried to roll over and found myself tangled in the sheets. Aaron, wake up. You're dreaming. He sucked in a labored breath and stilled. Wake up, please, wake up. Kicking at the body pillow wedged between my knees and calves, I tugged and pulled at the covers until I had enough slack to flop to my other side. My brain refused to make sense of the situation before me. Aaron lay flat on his back with a blob of energy sitting on his chest. No, not a blob. The dark specter had the vague outline of a woman a woman grinding away on my man's ribcage. Get off him! I had a fair amount of magic at my disposal. I could turn into a flaming bird and incinerate her, but last time I checked, shadows weren't flammable. I could try to banish her, but using that much energy posed a risk to the baby. The baby? Can she reach inside my gut and touch him like Lulu did? I couldn't risk it. Screaming at the top of my lungs, I scrambled away. The creature continued to move as if riding a horse or, well, riding Aaron. 
She leaned over his prone form and hunched her back, her face mere inches from his. Her energy flashed brighter while his dimmed. She's stealing his soul. I tried to scream again, to call for help, to cast a spell to send her away. But no sound came out. It felt as if I had swallowed a bag of cotton balls. Rasson came through the door with enough force that wood separated from hinges. He glanced from me, huddled against the far wall, to Aaron and back. What's wrong? You can't see it? My voice cracked. See what? I didn't have time to contemplate the difference between this creature and Lulu's hitchhiker. Instead, I shouted incoherent sentences. Spirit woman, attack and Aaron, his chest, hurry. Get out of here. Easier said than done. I couldn't move for fear I'd collapse. One second Bryson was a man, the next he'd shifted into his spirit animal, the great hawk. The bird let out an ear-piercing screech. The being turned her head and hissed. The hawk must have seen and heard her because he shook his head and launched himself toward the bed. Talons, sharp enough to cut steel, sliced through the air. And, to my surprise, the creature. Her howl reminded me of hurricane-force winds funneling down an alley, angry, loud, and capable of destroying anything in its path. Unable to properly fly in the confines of the room, the hawk landed on the far side of the bed and repeated the maneuver. This time, the being vanished before contact. Aaron didn't as much as flinch. Please tell me he's okay. My trembling legs gave out and I sank to the floor. Bryson shifted back to his human form and shook Aaron's shoulder. Hey, wake up. Aaron had his back to me, but I didn't need to see his face to know he'd opened his eyes. His body went from relaxed to tense to boneless. Bryson shook him again. You okay? Exhausted. His voice came out gravelly, as if he'd gargled sandpaper. I had another dream. I need you to sit up and not fall back to sleep. Aaron tried to follow instructions, but twice he slipped and fell back into a slumber so deep Bryson had to rouse him. I'm up. He didn't sound up. He sounded like he was talking in his sleep again. Tessa. I'm going to set him upright. Come over here and keep him awake until I get back. He lifted Aaron's shoulders and shoved my body pillow behind him. Where are you going? What if that thing comes back? I sat on the edge of the bed to keep Aaron from falling over. I have a tincture that should keep him awake. Bryson left the room before I could reply. What happened? Aaron pinched the bridge of his nose but even the small movement seemed to cost him. He sighed and dropped his arm to his side. There was another creature or spirit or something. She was attacking you. I bit my lip to keep from saying too much and freaking him out even more. Some things were best discussed wide awake and preferably in broad daylight. Being ridden like a prized racehorse by a shadow woman intent on stealing your soul topped the list. His eyes widened. My dream. The murderer was sucking me dry like a vampire. I hadn't thought to equate the attack to a vampire, but it was darned close. I don't smell anything. Me either. His eyelids drooped. But the killer looked the same. I patted his cheek. Uh-uh, you're staying awake. Tell me more about the dream. Another murder scene. I chased the perp into the woods. She turned on me. He furrowed his brows. There's another victim. We'll call Samuels after you've had a dose of Bryson's magic go-go juice. Huh? Never mind. I glanced over my shoulder, hoping Bryson would hurry the heck up. When I turned back, Aaron had drifted off again. 
Aaron Joseph Burns, open your eyes. It must be bad if you're using my middle name. He grinned and stared at me through tiny slits. Feels like I'm on morphine. A piece of the puzzle snapped into place. She wasn't stealing his soul. She was siphoning his energy. Bryson, the tincture isn't going to help. Aaron grimaced. No yelling. I'm awake. The clinking of glass on glass announced Bryson's return. It's a stopgap to prevent another attack. Right, but I think she was some sort of vampire siphoning off his energy. That'd explain the fatigue. Holy crap on toast. Is there such a thing as an energy vampire? Or any vampire, for that matter? Not that I'm aware of, but there are beings who steal the life force of their victims. His frown deepened. And others who kill to harvest magic. I don't know which this creature was stealing, but it was definitely a woman. I couldn't see her. Bryson set the tincture on the dresser. I'd like to know why some are visible and others aren't. Me too. I turned back to Aaron. One thing at a time. Right now, our one thing is healing him. Agreed. Bryson drew a deep breath but he took more than air into his lungs. He drew life from the earth. He'd basically plugged into the planet to recharge his battery. I wondered about the energy he borrowed. Could I do the same to replenish my stores if I needed to do a spell before the baby was born? Could we use it the next time we came under attack? I opened my mouth to voice my questions, but Bryson shocked the bejeebers out of me. He pressed his mouth to Aaron's and laid one heck of a kiss on him. It might have started as a PG-13 movie lip on lip, but it turned into a full-blown triple X panty melting whammy. Wow. Aaron pulled back and stared. Wow is right. I fanned my face to cool my flaming cheeks. Bryson dipped his chin and cleared his throat. I should have warned you. The exchange of energy is intimate. That's an understatement. I giggled despite the seriousness of the situation. It's also amazing. Why haven't we done that before? We have, when we took each other as mates. Oh, I don't remember it being like that. I regretted the words as soon as they left my mouth. I mean, our mating rituals were incredible, but they were, we were, there was a lot of dangerous stuff going on around us. The men smirked. What I meant was, why haven't we borrowed energy from the earth when we've been in trouble in the past? Seems to me it would have helped. The law of conservation of energy. Bryson grinned like my confused expression amused him. I motioned for him to explain. I haven't had a science class since my freshman year of college. Energy cannot be destroyed or created. There's a finite amount. Much like magic, there's always a price to pay. I hated physics in school, but I hated magical physics even more. So what? You're telling me because you borrowed magic from the earth, a sinkhole's liable to open up and swallow the house? No. He frowned. I took what little magic remained in our wards. We will need to repair them soon. Aaron sat up on his own accord and threw the covers off. Sorry to kiss and run, but I need to check in with Samuels. There's been another murder. Bryson clamped a hand on his shoulder. Make the call, but I need you to stick around. We have to figure out what we're up against before it comes at us again. That reminds me. I need to speak to Charlie. If anyone can tell us what this is and why it's attacking Aaron, it's him. I flashed them a smile, which turned into a frown when they exchanged glances. Talk to him tomorrow after you've gotten some rest, Bryson said. 
I agreed with him, but I had no intention of telling him that. It would set a precedent. A precedent they could use to justify locking me in the house for the next seven months. Um, fine. This is too important to wait. Charlie might know what's going on around here and how to fix it. Aaron ran his hand down my back. He's been running nonstop for days. Get some sleep. Fine. I tugged to the covers over my legs. Good night, they said in unison, but took turns kissing me good night. The smart Alec and me couldn't resist getting the last word. I pointed to the ruins of our bedroom door. One of you might want to fix that before anyone exchanges any more energy or body fluids. Chapter 16 Since moving into Charlie and Dottie's house, we'd made some significant changes to the floor plan. For starters, the guys had built us a brand new master bedroom and a bathroom big enough for the three of us to share. However, one room hadn't changed. Charlie's office. I crawled to the center of the twin-sized bed and allowed the familiarity of the space to wrap around me like a warm blanket. The old desk still sat in the corner. Jars still lined the bookcase. If I closed my eyes and focused, I could smell him. Cedar, wood smoke, and old spice. Charlie? Are you there? It had taken over a year for his spirit to come to me. I was hurt when I'd found out he'd visited Dottie several times shortly after he'd died. Heck, he'd spoken to Jolene before me. But when he'd finally made his appearance, it had been a showstopper. How many women can claim their grandfather returned from the dead to walk them down the aisle on their wedding day? Unfortunately... He'd gone all but silent since giving me away. The same pressure at the base of my neck I'd felt at Graham May's returned. This time, it didn't scare me. It felt like a warm hand guiding me, or perhaps picking me up by the scruff as if I were a wayward puppy. Is someone there? Once again, I closed my eyes and focused on the energy around me. Achila? Charlie? I'm here, little flame. My grandfather's voice caressed my ear as light as a feather. I glanced around the room in hopes of seeing his weathered face. Why can't I see you? These are troubling times. I must remain on my side of the great veil. My chest tightened. You know about what happened to Lulu? I do. The weight of his presence lessened, and for a terrifying moment, I thought he'd gone. Grandfather? You mustn't keep her spirit captive long. I sighed. Do you know what or who killed her? I'm afraid I don't. The pressure on my neck increased. You and your mates are in great danger. You must repair the barrier between your world and mine. The veil is broken? Images of Lulu's ghost and the inky darkness that accompanied her flashed through my mind. But they paled in comparison to the memories of the creature sucking the life out of Aaron. Achila and I are doing all we can to keep folks where they belong. But we can't continue forever. Nor can we watch over you and the others while we fight here. Fight? I found myself cradling my unborn child. Are you in danger too? Yes, little flame. We are all weakened. How do we fix it? Find the one who is damaging it. Right. Easy enough. Unlike Achila and the other elders I'd come into contact with, he spoke plainly, but I wished he had more answers. Any idea what we're looking for? As soon as the words left my mouth, I thought of Jolene. Is it Jojo? 
The pressure on my neck vanished, along with his essence. Charlie? A cool wind blew through the room hard enough to make me shiver. Oddly enough, it didn't disturb my hair or the papers on the desk. The breeze seemed to move through rather than around me. The tear in the veil. I left the office as quick as my puffy feet would carry me. Brasson and Aaron stood in the kitchen with their heads together. From the looks of it, they were in the middle of a heated discussion. A discussion that ended the second I walked into the room. Where are the kids? I noted the dirty dishes and a stack of cold pancakes on the counter. What's going on? Brasson took a step back. They're outside, playing with Maddie. Were you able to speak to Charlie? Yes. He said someone is damaging the veil between the physical and spirit worlds. We have to find the culprit and fix the tear. Brasson said, Any idea who? After the way Jojo handled Lulu the other night, I'm thinking she's doing it on accident. We need to talk to her and find out. I suspect she's been reaching out to her mom. Both men tensed. Don't look so concerned. I'm hoping it's her. If not, we're going to be looking for a needle in a football field. I motioned to them. Now, what did I walk in on? Aaron did the thing where he opens his mouth and quasi smiles while rubbing his jaw. Uh. I hated the expression. Not only did it tell me he had something heavy to discuss, it told me I wouldn't like it. Or, in this case, maybe Bryson had a problem with the subject. Spill it. I haven't got all day to stand here waiting. The kids won't stay outside forever, and there's the little problem of my mother and grandfather battling to keep evil spirits from setting up shop in our living room. The men gawked. Brasson gave me a hard look. Next time, lead with that. I pinned Aaron with a death stare. He sighed. I was right. There was another murder last night. Same M.O. as Lulu, but I can't get any more information. Samuels and I aren't on the case. I resisted the urge to tap my foot. And? And you're the victim's advocate assigned on call. Aaron looked anywhere except at Brasson. Oh. A pang of guilt curdled in my stomach. No wonder Aaron was so frustrated with the situation, and no wonder they were arguing. I'll go. This might be the break we need to get Tank out of trouble. Aaron sighed. Normally, I'd agree, but the psychiatric hold makes it more difficult to give him a get-out-of-jail-free card. Bryson folded his arms and stood there, as still and as silent as a marble statue. Whatever remorse I'd felt for taking Aaron's head off vanished. I'd had enough of the roadblocks keeping me from doing my damned job. I was pregnant, not an invalid. Bryson, you've got something to say? We're vulnerable here. I can't put the wards back until we repair the veil. The muscles on the side of his jaw budged. The investigation can wait. I agree, but somehow it's all related. I'm going. Truth be told, I didn't know for sure the killings and the problem with the veil were related. Plus, I didn't want to see another skinned corpse, but I wasn't about to tell him. Not when he'd gone into full caveman mode. He seemed to consider my words. Or my sanity. Maybe both. Go. See what you can learn and get back here as soon as possible. I'll speak to Jojo while you're gone. Wait, what? He agreed? I glanced at Aaron. Fat lot of good it did. He shrugged and grabbed his keys. I'm driving. You're not on the case. Doesn't mean I can't drive my wife to the crime scene and make sure she's safe. Fine. Give me five to change into a uniform. I turned on my heel and stormed into the bedroom, and by stormed, I mean waddled forcibly. 
Bryson was bad enough, but Aaron, too? I couldn't handle both of them carrying clubs and wearing animal skins. Someone needed to be rational in this relationship, and my raging hormones ruled me out. Aaron and I left the house four minutes later. I knew because I set a timer on my phone when I walked into the bedroom. Call me crazy, but given the tension in the house, I needed to be prepared for the inevitable, his complaining. I'll never understand what takes you so long to get ready. He tightened his grip on the steering wheel. I held the cell so he could see the screen. Four minutes and ten seconds. You timed yourself? He fought to hold back his grin. Four minutes and ten seconds to change clothes. Do you have any idea how hard it is to tie your sneakers when you can't see your feet? No. He covered his mouth, likely to keep from laughing. How about how many times you have to pee because you have a baby flattening your bladder to the shape of a pancake? He shook his head. Okay, then. No more complaining. I dropped my phone back into my purse like a performer dropping the microphone. He glanced at me with his brows so high, his forehead resembled an accordion. What was your excuse before you were pregnant? Something inside me snapped. I punched his arm hard enough that he winced and rubbed the spot. Hey, no need to commit domestic violence. I was kidding. He squeezed my hand. Are you okay? Sorry. It took me a minute to come up with an answer. I'm worried about TJ and the veil thing, but honestly, I'm more upset about you and Bryson interfering with my job. Aaron pulled his hand free and turned the car into a subdivision. I get it. I can't stand not being in the middle of the action. Heck, I'm tagging along with you because I can't not be on this case. His use of a double negative made me smile. So, you'll back off? I didn't say that, but I'm willing to find a compromise. Aaron slowed and glanced around the area before easing onto the shoulder. Why are we stopping? I've seen this house before. He grabbed his mag light from beneath his seat. There's a retention pond behind it and some trees. Okay. I didn't like the way the color drained from his face or the tension in the corners of his eyes. Stay here. No way. I unclicked my seatbelt and reached for the door handle. Tessa, I mean it. I think the perp is hiding back there. All the more reason for you to call for backup. I struggled to catch my breath. I'd had anxiety attacks in the past, but this was different. This felt as if my entire ribcage had moved up four or five inches. Stay in the car. He opened the door and flipped on the flashlight. I turned to get out of the car. Pain shot from my vagina to the top of my belly, ricocheted off my sternum, and landed in my thighs. I groaned and doubled over, or tried to anyway. Not funny. You're not due for another six weeks. I grabbed his arm and pulled with every ounce of my strength. He turned and met my gaze. I don't know what he saw in my expression, but it caused the color to leach from his cheeks. Oh, shit. You're not kidding. No. Shaking my head, I tried to draw a breath, but it felt as if something blocked my airway. Is it contractions? Do we need to go to the hospital? One-handed, he fumbled with his phone and ended up dropping it. Twice. I'm calling Bryson. The pressure in my chest eased enough for me to unlock my fingers from his arm. Not yet. Tessa, what's happening? I need you to talk to me. He swallowed hard. I'm trained, but I'd rather not deliver this child on the side of the road. It's better. I think Quinn decided to use my diaphragm and cervix as trampolines. He made a face somewhere between pained and disturbed. Okay, let's get you home. It's only a few minutes to the crime scene. 
If it happens again between here and there, you can take me to the hospital. If not, I have a job to do. Aaron put the car in drive and eased back onto the road. I'll take you to the scene, but I'm putting you back in the car and driving you to the ER if you as much as stub your toe, understand? Yes, sir. Much to my surprise, I found his bossiness kind of hot. Or maybe it was getting my way while he pretended to be bossy. Chapter 17 My first impression of the crime scene troubled me. I had zero doubt the same person had killed Lulu and the latest victim. Two deaths weren't enough to establish a pattern, but it would make everyone's jobs a lot easier if we discovered a connection. The house had absolutely nothing in common with Tank and Lulu's trailer. It must have cost more than six brand new double wides. Everything from the soft leather furniture to the artwork on the walls screamed money. What would Mr. Campo possibly have in common with my obnoxious cousin? I knew better than to think murders didn't happen in places like this, but they happened less frequently. Before I had a chance to sort through my preconceived notions about the location of the crime, Detective Jankowski took me by the arm and marched me to the exit. Hey, let me go! I jerked away from him. I'd never officially met the guy, but his reputation preceded him. You can't be here. He reminded me of a caricature of a 1950s newspaper reporter. Jowly, red-faced, and sporting a belly that rivaled my own, he glared with beady dark eyes. All he needed was a stubby cigar hanging out of his mouth and suspenders to hold up his two small britches. Excuse me? I wanted to wipe his cooties from my arm. I'm Tessa. I know who you are. Jankowski's upper lip curled. Your Burns wife, the so-called psychic. Actually, I flashed in my credentials. I'm the victim's advocate assigned to this case. He squared his shoulders, which made his gut stick out even more. The Vic's wife is at the neighbor's. First house to the right. Great. I'll need the basic information before I speak to her. Husband's dead. Suddenly, staying home with three kids didn't seem like such a bad idea. I sucked in a breath and did my best to find my happy place. I gathered that much. Did the wife find the body? Did she witness the violence? What can you tell me about her mental state? He turned and walked away. Thanks for your help! I smiled like a lunatic and waved. I'll be sure to let the chief know how cooperative you've been. Jerk-faced Jankowski flipped me the finger without as much as a backward glance. Asshole. I walked to the end of the driveway and stared back at the house. None of the curtains were pulled on the first or second floor. In fact, some of the windows were open. This in and of itself wasn't unusual on a nice day, but it wasn't a nice day. Saunas had less humidity, and it had to be in the mid-80s. Not exactly air the house out weather. On a hunch, I stopped one of the techs I recognized from the station. I see they opened the windows. Did it help with the smell? The woman wrinkled her nose. I wish. Do you have any eucalyptus rub in your kit? It helps if you smear some under your nose. She frowned. I do, but it slipped my mind after seeing... Between Aaron's dream and the fact someone had tipped him off about the case, I figured the victim had died the same way as Lulu, but I needed to be sure. It's not every day you come across flaying as a cause of death and no blood. What's up with that? I glanced away in hopes she wouldn't notice my bluffing. Her shudder told me I'd assumed correctly. It's the worst case I've worked on. Me too. I turned back toward the house and watched the upstairs windows. Most of the police activity centered in the room on the far left. 
Did they remove the body from the bedroom? The medical examiner isn't finished. She looked away. The mental health therapist and me recognized a woman struggling to come to terms with her brush with pure, unadulterated evil. Without some sort of help, she ran the risk of developing anxiety, PTSD, and a whole host of other problems. I had an idea. Let me give you my card. I'm a counselor as well as a VA. Thanks. This one is bad, and I'd rather not talk to the shrink at the station. She winced. I mean, no offense. I know you're a mental health counselor. None taken. I handed her my contact info. Give me a call any time. She smiled at my expanding midsection. When are you due? Not for another five weeks and three days. I glanced around for Aaron, but couldn't find him in the crowd of neighbors and uniformed officers. Have you seen Detective Burns? He's not working the case. Her eyes widened. You're his wife, right? Tessa? Guilty as charged. I'm Emily. Sorry, I should have recognized your red hair. I've seen you with him, but I'm usually looking at his... Her cheeks flushed. He's pretty easy on the eyes. Early in the relationship, comments like hers would have bugged me. Marrying two guys who scored well above ten on the hotness meter had taught me to control my jealousy. It did not, however, teach me how to stop worrying. Where the heck is he? I should get back in there. The humor drained from her face. I meant what I said. Call me any time. I waited for her to enter the house before I pulled my phone from my bag and dialed Aaron. Hey, everything okay? His words came out breathy, as if I'd interrupted his workout. As well as can be expected, I turned and scanned the crowd. Where are you? Close. Have you spoken to the victim's spouse? Close? I just bet he was close. In fact, I had a sneaking suspicion he'd doubled back to the front of the neighborhood. I'm on my way there now. White colonial to the right of the scene. Be here in five minutes or I'll have half the force searching for you at the retention pond. He sighed. I'm on my way. I slid my cell into my purse and made my way to the house on the right. So help me, if he gets himself hurt, I'm going to strangle him. A teenage boy with perfect skin and straight teeth opened the front door before I had a chance to knock. My stars! I pressed my hand to my chest. Didn't mean to scare you. He glanced over his shoulder and then back to me. Are you here to see Mrs. Campo? I caught myself openly gawking at the kid. He seemed familiar, as in I'd seen him on television or in a movie. Yes, I'm Tessa Lamar, victim's advocate with the Orange County Police Department. Micah Sterling, nice to meet you. He frowned. What's a victim's advocate? My job is to provide emotional support, information about available services, and assistance in completing paperwork. He nodded and looked away. I'm not sure this is a good time. Let me ask her. Okay. I struggled to keep from grinning like a lovesick schoolgirl. Micah Sterling starred in JoJo's favorite TV show as a vampire slayer in a gender-flipped reboot of Buffy. He shut the door. I ran through my memory of the mountain of procedural manuals I'd read during the orientation with the OCPD for a policy regarding asking for an autograph while on duty. As far as I knew, he wasn't related to the victim. And, technically, we weren't at the crime scene. What would it hurt? Micah stepped outside. I apologize, but she's not up for visitors. I understand. Let me give you my card in case she has any questions or concerns later. I'm easier to get a hold of than the detectives. 
Grinning like an idiot, I fished my business card holder out of the bottom of my bag and took out two. Would you mind signing the back of one? My daughter is a huge fan of yours. He hesitated. I'm sorry. It's a bad time. I shouldn't have asked. Micah's expression went from wounded kid to movie star smile in the blink of an eye. It's no big. I'll sign it. I handed him the cards and the pen. Thank you. He scribbled his name and handed it back to me. A young man who resembled Micah opened the door. He took one look at me and sucked in a breath. I assumed his reaction had to do with my giant pregnant belly, but I would have sworn I caught a flash of recognition in his eyes. The guy glared. My mother isn't going to talk to the police without a lawyer present. Lucky for him, I didn't suspect his mother of hurting her husband. Otherwise, lawyering up this quick would have put me on high alert. Oh, I'm not... Dude, she's not a cop. She's here to help, Micah huffed. Whatever she is, get rid of her. Mom's asking for you. He gave me one last dirty look and closed the door. Noah, my brother. I wish I could blame his rudeness on the circumstances, but he's always been a douche. A handful of words in the English language make me cringe. Douche ranked in the top ten. However, it wasn't his potty mouth that made me cringe. I'd completely misread the situation. Your real name isn't Sterling, is it? No, it's Campo. His voice cracked. How did my dad die? A knot formed around my heart. I couldn't lie, but Jankowski hadn't bothered to tell me what information I could release. Surely Mrs. Campo had said something to her sons? Micah sighed. My mom, she was hysterical. She claims the person who killed my dad wasn't human. Struggling to find the right words, I rested my hand on his upper arm. I needed to buy some time to talk to Aaron and possibly the chief before I could answer his questions. I didn't see your father, but I will ask the detective working the case about the cause of death. I keep thinking this has something to do with me. He stared with such intensity I took a step back. I don't know if it's because of the role I play on the show or what, but I have some seriously disturbed fans. Once again, I had no words. How many more kids would lose a parent before we solved the case? I harbored no illusions that traditional investigation techniques would catch this killer. I did, however, see a silver lining in the dark clouds. If Mrs. Campo's story matched tanks, the authorities would have a harder time dismissing their statements. It's very important you and your mother tell the police everything. You never know what bit of information will be the lead they need to find out who hurt your father. You expect my mom to tell the cops a Nosferatu killed my dad? He scoffed. I recognized the term from his show. Nosferatu were hideous vampires, as opposed to the normal good-looking variety. Yes. If that's what she saw, then yes. My family has had enough bad press. If this got out, it'd be like the situation with my brother all over again. I remembered hearing something about his older brother on the gossip shows, but the details escaped me. Plus, I needed to keep him focused on the moment at hand, not some scandal that happened last year. I'm not much of a cable news watcher. Someone claimed Noah and his girlfriend were part of a cult and leaked it to the press. His frown deepened. It was a circus. They accused me of being a member and suggested I believed the stuff on my show was real. How awful. I'd had run-ins with the media because of my abilities. I understood what it felt like to worry about your career because people thought you were a whack job. 
However, if I had any shot of clearing Tank's name, I needed Mrs. Campo to testify, even if that meant a little creative embellishment on investigation techniques. You know, if your mom tells them what she saw, the crime scene investigators may shift gears. I mean, if they suspect the perpetrator was wearing a costume, they might look for latex and makeup. Micah Sterling's face brightened. I didn't think of that. Encourage her to tell the truth, no matter how weird it sounds. He studied my business card. I will, and I'm going to have her give you a call. I'm happy to help. I might not have any new leads, but Mrs. Campo's testimony was a start in the right direction. I'll leave you be. Take care, Micah. The kid whipped out his phone, slung his arm around me, and snapped a picture before I had a chance to smile. I'll text you a copy for your daughter. Just don't post it on social media or anything, okay? I can't promise she won't print it and stick it on her wall, but it won't show up on the internet. We aren't on social media. He gave me a horrified stare, laughed, and went inside. I turned to walk back to the crime scene and found Aaron standing a few feet away, just out of sight of the front door. He tilted his head. Was that the kid from Vampire Suck? Chapter 18 On the drive home, I filled Aaron in on everything from the jerk detective to my conversation with Micah Starling. He nodded and made grunting sounds now and then, but I highly doubted he'd processed anything I said. It's good news, right? I gave him side eye. Sure is. He drummed his fingers on the steering wheel. I mean, it's a huge break in the case. Aliens, who would have thought it possible? He nodded, stopped, and frowned. Sorry, I'm distracted. Really? I didn't notice. I turned as far as my belly and the seat belt would allow. Did you find anything at the retention pond? No, it's odd. He pulled into a shopping center and cut the engine. It was the place from my dream, but different. How so? He took so long to answer, I thought he'd missed the question. Aaron? Hang on. He grabbed his phone and scrolled through several photos before turning the screen toward me. See this tree? Uh-huh. In my dream, it was broken in two and there was debris on the ground. He showed me a series of images from the area around the pond. We had storms last week. Maybe you saw the past? We may have lived in the sunshine state, but it rained like the Dickens almost every day in the summer and early fall. If that's the case, then the perp could have been stalking the victim. He sighed like a man carrying the weight of the world on his back. You and Bryson know plenty of people who use magic. There has to be someone we can talk to about this. I had an idea. Actually, there is someone who might be able to help. And it just so happens she works in a diner. I don't know about you, but I'm starved. I could eat. He leaned forward and kissed me. Where to? I'll pull it up on GPS. You call Bryson and tell him we're going to pay Scarlet a visit. Who's Scarlet? You'll see. I should have warned him about the elderly seer, but it'd be far more fun to see his reaction going in cold. He gave me a dubious look and dialed his cell. Hey, Tessa thinks Scarlet might be able to shed some light on my magical puberty. I couldn't make out Bryson's words, but his laughter boomed through the phone. We'll be home in a couple hours. He disconnected and gave me another curious glance. You're not going to tell me anything about this mystery woman? Nope. Fifteen minutes later, Aaron parked in front of the 50s-style diner. He ducked his head and stared out the windshield. Are you sure about this? Yep, and Bryson agreed. Come on. I twisted to open my car door, and another bolt of pain stole my breath. 
Are you all right? He rested his hand between my shoulder blades. I nodded because I didn't trust my voice not to crack. Two or three deep breaths later, I hoisted myself out of the car. Aaron hovered around me like a spotter waiting for me to screw up my bench press. You're pale. We should get you home or to a hospital. I took a moment to make sure my legs would hold me upright. It's probably Braxton Hicks contractions. They're common in late pregnancy. I don't like the sound of that. He scratched his jaw. It's nothing to worry about. I hooked my arm in his. If I were in real labor, the pains would come more often and at regular intervals. Right. I remember that from those classes we took. He led me inside. The wonderful aromas of fried food, grilled meat, and chili made my stomach growl. See, further proof I'm not in labor. Women lose their appetites right before their babies are born. Tessa. Scarlet wiped her hands on her apron as she came around from behind the counter. Good to see you. My goodness, you're glowing. People always say that, but I think the correct term is growing. I clutched my purse to remind myself not to shake her hand. Scarlet could see a person's past and a teensy bit of their future through skin-to-skin -skin contact. We weren't here for me. Erin needed her help. She gave me a knowing look and turned to my blue-eyed detective. And you're Aaron, having some trouble in your sleep, are you? His smile faltered, but he extended his hand. I, yes, on both counts. Nice to meet you. You can call me Scarlet. She wrapped her fingers around his. Aaron jolted. I felt guilty for not warning him for about half a second. The expression on the woman's face erased any doubt I'd done the right thing. Unless I'd missed my mark, she'd seen something important. Wide-eyed and mouth hanging open, she shook her head nice and slow. Woo-wee! We need to sit down for this. He shot me a dirty look. What just happened? Scarlet chuckled. She didn't tell you about me? No. His singular word hung in the air like a smoke ring. Come on, let's have a talk. She ushered Aaron to a booth in the back of the diner. I turned toward the dessert case. From the sound of it, I had time to enjoy a burger and slice a pecan pie while they chatted. Oh, no, you're not getting off the hook that easy. Scarlet waved me over. This involves you almost as much as him. Great. I cast one last long and look at the sweets before trudging to the back. Don't look so glum. She motioned a waitress over. I'd never starve a pregnant woman. Thanks. I smiled at the young woman who offered me a menu. I don't need that. I'd like a cheeseburger with the works and a piece of a pecan pie. Could you warm it and add a scoop of chocolate ice cream? The woman wrinkled her nose. Sure. Aaron muttered. Coffee. Black. I'll put your order in right away. She flashed him a grin and hurried into the kitchen. You should try the burgers. They're really good. Just the right amount of grease. I'm good. He turned his attention back to the elderly woman. How does this work? Scarlet rested her hand, palm side up on the table, and crooked her fingers. Let me take another look. Aaron couldn't have moved slower if he'd tried. He reached out to her as if holding a bite-sized piece of meat in front of a rabid dog. What exactly are you going to do? I'm what's known as a seer. It's just like it sounds. I touch you, and I see things. She traced a line running from his index finger to the base of his hand. What sort of things? He directed this question to me. She helped me when I first learned I was a Ninahi. I grinned, remembering the first time Bryson had brought me to the diner. 
She'd freaked me out. But the more I'd gotten to know her, the more I loved her. Scarlet tilted her head. You're a half-blood? No, that's not right. Her mouth fell open. No wonder. No wonder what? I leaned forward and studied Aaron's palm. Not that I thought I could see anything, but because it beat the heck out of looking into her cloudy eyes. Sometimes I swore she could see right into a person's soul. Aaron sat so still, I doubted he'd bothered to take a breath since he'd given her his hand. Scarlet met his gaze and lowered her voice. You have none of ye magic in your veins, but you are human. He nodded. You died, but you're still alive. He nodded again. Only this time he swallowed hard enough I heard him gulp. You are of this world, but you have one foot in the next. She curled his fingers and squeezed. It's no wonder you can't stay in your body. I choked on my own spit. Coughing up a blue streak, I held up my hand. Scarlet took it as an invitation, or at least an opportunity, and grabbed my wrist. Her pale blue eyes rolled back, and she made a strangled sound. Her grip tightened to the point of pain. I cried out, but her nails continued to bite into my skin. You're hurting me. Aaron placed his hand over hers. Let's go. Her eyes flew open. She glanced between us, and the blood pooling beneath her fingers as if she had no idea who we were or what she'd done. Scarlet? I pulled my arm free of her grasp and pressed a napkin over the four half-moon-shaped wounds. Oh, child, I didn't mean to hurt you. Please forgive me. Her voice cracked. It's your son, my heart gave a hard thump and sped into a gallop. What about the baby? Aaron's police training kicked in, and he eased away from me. In the face of a perceived threat, he wanted room to draw his sidearm. Not about to let him shoot an old woman, I took his hand in my greasy one. He's stronger than his parents combined. She stared, as if the notion shook her to her core. I pressed my hand to my belly. I don't understand. Scarlet gave herself a little shake. He's going to be important to a great many people, but that means many more will want to stop him. I didn't like the sound of that. Not one bit. I thought you couldn't see much of the future. I can't. She let out a nervous laugh and met Aaron's gaze. That little one of yours showed it to me. He's a lot like his father. I hated the way they stared at each other. They reminded me of gunslingers with itchy trigger fingers. Stubborn as a mule? Opinionated? Scarlet looked away. Exactly. I don't know what else I expected from Bryson's son. The words slipped out before I realized what I'd said. I had no way of knowing which of my men had knocked me up. But deep down, I'd always assumed it was Bryson. Aaron tensed and Scarlet furrowed her brow. The waitress returned with my burger, two glasses of water, and his coffee. If she picked up on the tension at the table, she didn't let on. Then again, she was probably used to folks visiting the seer. Anything else? No, thanks. Suddenly, the plate of juicy, beefy goodness didn't seem all that appetizing. Aaron put his hands flat on the table. I've heard enough. We're leaving. Leaving? I understood why he'd want to go. The conversation had rattled me, too, but we hadn't begun to get the information we needed. We're not done. He stood. Speak for yourself. Scarlet sat back. I know why you want to leave. But you're wrong. Aaron bristled. You don't know me. I know you're afraid of more than this creature you're hunting. 
she sighed. Don't let those fears be your ruination. I glanced between them. I'm confused. So am I. Aaron held his hand out to me. We should go. Now. Scarlet watched us with a hint of a smile. No, I'm staying until we get what we came for. Food and answers. To prove my point, I took a huge bite of my burger before turning my attention back to the seer. You said something about him not staying in his body. Bryson called it dreamwalking. Is that what it is? She hitched a shoulder. It doesn't matter what you call it. What matters is that he learns to control it. Now we were getting somewhere. How does he do that? Scarlet nodded to my obstinate husband. First, he has to be honest with you. I'll be in the car. Aaron glared, turned on his heel, and stormed out. I stared after him. Well, that's just great. Go easy on him. He's afraid. Of what? She gave me the sort of smile people usually reserved for funerals and divorce hearings. Full of pity and gratitude it wasn't them going through the ordeal. Himself? Losing control? Being a father? What the heck is she talking about? When Jolene first came to us, Aaron had sworn he didn't want kids. But that had changed when he found out she was his biological daughter. Since then, he'd become an awesome dad. All of that is pretty normal for a daddy to be. Is it? She studied me. He's also afraid of losing you and Bryson. That's ridiculous. Wasn't it? The whole thruple thing had been Aaron's idea. Was he having second thoughts? She ignored my comment. Tessa. He's a strong man, used to doing a difficult job and doing it well. He carries a heavy weight without complaint, but it's time he shared the load. I hated riddles almost as much as I hated physics. It's been a heck of a couple of days. Tell me plainly what's going on with him and how to fix it. She pursed her lips. Isn't that what I'm doing? Yes, sorry, but I don't understand. You will, when the time is right. Ugh, is she incapable of answering a question without creating 20 more? It occurred to me she probably did it on purpose to make me think. The problem was I was all thought out. I get it, I do. I'm a therapist by trade. We aren't supposed to tell our clients what to do. They have to figure it out for themselves. That's generally best. Between worrying about Tank and TJ and finding a monster and fixing the veil and having a baby and the million other decisions that needed to be made, I couldn't take one more thing. I hated to cry, doubly so in public but I couldn't hold back my emotions. Fine, I'll work out the relation stuff on my own, but I'm begging you, tell me how to help him with his magic. I can't find him unresponsive on the couch and think he's dead again. I can't wake up to a freaking shadowy being sucking out his energy. I can't, what did you say? She reached for my hand. I pulled back in the nick of time. No more readings. Not yet. Scarlet seemed to realize what she'd done and folded her hands in her lap. Tell me about the shadow. I told her everything, from waking up during the attack to my conversation with Charlie. While it felt good to get it off my chest, her expression troubled me. I stopped talking and waited for her to respond. She raised a trembling hand to her mouth. Tessa, do you realize how dangerous a tear in the veil is? I thought I did, but her reaction made me doubt myself. 
We're going to fix it, but we can use all the help we can get. Count me in. This affects more than you and yours. The spirits who cross over won't stay in one place long. They'll spread out to the four corners of the earth in search of people to terrorize. She shook her head. I need to speak to the three of you together. I turned my attention to the parking lot. Holding his phone to his ear, Aaron paced a rut in the asphalt. Between his scowl, stiff posture, and exaggerated hand gestures, I didn't need to hear the conversation to know he was seriously pissed. That might be easier said than done. I mulled over her warnings about dishonesty and fear. Until we'd walked into the diner, I would have said things were about as good as they could get between Aaron Brasson and me. That is, if I overlooked their wanting me to give up my job and raise the kids like a Stepford wife, what's he afraid of? Better question, what's he being dishonest about? Scarlet lowered her voice. I can see the wheels turning in your head. Give him time. That's not something we have these days, is it? No, I suppose not. I'll call Bryson. She stood and took several steps before turning back to me. Before I forget, I know a person who might be able to help you with your boo-hag problem. My what? Where have I heard that before? Scarlet ignored my question. Chapter 19 I stood on the front porch until Aaron's tail lights disappeared from view. Other than to tell me the chief of police had asked to see him and Samuels in his office, he'd barely spoken to me on the ride home from the diner. Me being me, I played Scarlet's words in my head like a looping jiff. Bryson stepped outside. Where's Aaron? Said he was needed at the station. I stared at the darkened drive. You don't believe him? I plopped down onto the porch swing. I don't know how to answer that. Isn't it a yes or no question? He offered me a half smile. One look at him and my blood pressure rose. I recognized his tone of voice. How could I not? I'd spent the previous hour with Scarlet giving me patient smiles and asking leading questions. I darn sure didn't need the same from him. If you have something to say, say it. His smile morphed into a frown. Mind if I sit? Suit yourself. Bryson moved as if afraid I'd bite if he made any sudden movements. Smart man. Did Scarlet call you? I winced at a twinge of pain in my lower back. Yes, she's very concerned about the tear in the veil. He rested a hand on my belly. Did she say anything else? We had so many huge problems to talk about. The situation with Aaron seemed almost trivial in comparison. I mean, who cared about relationship problems when someone had left the door wide open? Any manner of beings could come through and wreak havoc on the human race? She said, our child spoke to her. He leaned in and kissed my baby bump. And that he's something special. While I appreciated his devotion to our unborn child, developing a plan to handle Quinn's superpowers could wait until he was born. We had more urgent problems. Nothing about Aaron, then? Nothing I wasn't already aware of. He gave me a half-hearted smile, but he couldn't hide his disappointment. An odd sense of deja vu came over me. Like we'd had this conversation before. No, this was different. It felt more like Vuja Day. I had no freaking idea what he was talking about. Care to explain it to me? He's afraid he'll lose you and our family. Bryson slid his arm around me. He'll come around in time. I opened my mouth to argue, but there was no point in debating the truth. 
He's acting like he did when we first discussed adopting Jolene and starting a family. He is. I shifted so I could see his face. But we're married now. I mean, we're all married in spirit, but I am legally married to Aaron. How can he think he'll lose me? Lose us? Brasson brushed my hair back from my face. That is a question you'll have to ask him. I'm asking you since you seem to know so much about it. I refused to sit and listen to another person give me enough information to throw me off balance, but nothing to help me set a course. It sucked. It wasn't fair. I didn't have the time or the energy to solve some sort of verbal Rubik's Cube. I can speculate what's going on in his head, but neither of us will know for certain until we ask him. Since he all but refused to share his thoughts on Aaron, I went for the next item on my list. Did you know we have a boo hag problem? I'd never heard of them until Scarlet mentioned the term. He let his head fall back and stared at the ceiling. Darlene warned me not to let the boo hag ride me the other day. Folks around here claim they come into the house on laundry left on the line overnight. He fiddled with his phone. Boo hag, a legend from the Georgia and South Carolina low country. They are skinless creatures that suck the breath out of their victims while sitting on or riding their chests. If the victim should wake during the attack, the boo hag may steal their skin. We evidently have one. The memory of that thing sitting on top of Aaron gave me the heebies. Scarlet gave me a name of a root doctor in Georgia who has experience with them. I'll give him a call, but I'd like to do more research first. I'll go get the laptop. I turned, planted my feet on the porch, and immediately regretted it. The same pain that had troubled me earlier returned with a vengeance. It stole my breath and my sense of balance. My brain didn't have time to register I was falling, until I hit the wood planks. A split second later, Bryson loomed over me. His lips moved, but I couldn't hear him over the whoosh of blood behind my ears. My midsection burned, and not from the firebird. This felt more like a dozen hot pokers stabbing my guts and back and pelvic region. It's okay, I have you. It's going to be okay. He lifted me from the ground and carried me to the couch. The change in position brought on an entirely new level of hell. I saw stars. Tell me where it hurts. To his credit, his voice came out clear and calm. Everywhere. I struggled to catch my breath. Like before, it felt as if the baby had wedged himself under my diaphragm. Can't breathe. His eyes widened a fraction before he smoothed his expression. I'm going to call Dr. Dennison. Try to remain still. It wasn't like I planned to get up and do a jig. Heck, I could barely nod. Once again, I could hear him talking, but I had no idea what he'd said. For all I knew, he was speaking in Greek. My singular focus was the riot going on inside my body. Brasson returned to my side. I need to see if you're spotting. May I? Yes. The mere thought of bleeding this late in my pregnancy scared the life out of me. My mind traveled down everything that can go wrong road and dead ended at I won't survive the loss lane. Like it had earlier in the day, the pain stopped as quickly as it had come. Bryson hissed and jerked his hand back. I don't believe it. The pressure in my chest returned, but this was different. This was my heart breaking. Oh, God, no. Am I bleeding? Are we losing the baby? Tears streamed down his face, but he smiled a big, bright, beautiful smile. No. What the hell? I propped myself up on my elbows, half expecting to see a bloody mess, but found nothing out of sorts. 
Bryson placed a hand on each side of my belly and met my gaze. Quinn healed you. My brain stuttered. I don't understand. Neither do I. He pressed his forehead against my tummy and sighed. I felt his magic when I reached for you. Scarlet was right about him. I hated to rain on his proud papa parade, but I needed to know what had caused the pain in the first place. It's happened three times today. I thought it was Braxton Hicks or the baby kick in the wrong place, but this time was worse. He seemed to snap back to the issue at hand. Dr. D is expecting a call back. I'll ask him if he wants to meet us at the hospital tonight or see you in his office tomorrow. Okay. But what if something's really wrong? What if the doctor misses the problem because the baby keeps healing me? What happens when the little guy can't fix it? My voice rose in volume and pitch. We can't exactly tell him our son is a Nunahi wizard child. Bryson stared as if he hadn't understood a word I'd said. His expression went from stunned to confused to nauseous. Mr. Cool under pressure began to crack. I didn't mean to yell. I pushed myself upright. It's not that. He smiled, but it seemed forced. Not exactly the reaction I needed. Not when I was one wrong word away from a full-blown panic attack. You should keep your feet higher than your heart. I'll call the doc back. First Aaron, now Bryson? Had they both suffered from some sort of pregnancy stress-induced meltdown? I curled up on my side and tried not to think about raising a child with more magic than the three of us combined. How on earth would we get him to eat his veggies if he could level us with a wave of his hand? Bryson returned a few moments later. Whatever the doctor had said seemed to have calmed him down. Dr. Dennison said to go straight to the emergency room if you have any more pain. Otherwise, stay off your feet tonight. He wants to see you first thing in the morning. Thanks. I stared at the television, but didn't bother to turn it on. My mind was elsewhere. Besides the problems with Aaron and threat of invasion from an army of evil spirits, we hadn't even started to put the nursery together. Heck, I hadn't gotten around to opening my shower gifts. Will you be all right here for a few minutes while I ask Grandma to keep the kids overnight? I nodded. You might as well take changes of clothes and PJs with you. You know she'll say yes. Do you mind if I tell her you're experiencing some pain and the doc wants to see you? He brushed his fingertips across my cheek. I nuzzled against his hand. That's fine. Just make sure the kids don't overhear you. Jojo will want to check on me, and TJ doesn't need anything else to worry about. I agree. He disappeared down the hall and returned with a stack of clothes. I'll only be a few minutes. Take your time. My stomach growled. See if she has any ribs and birthday cake left. Will do. After he left, I counted to a hundred and waddled into the office. I might not have been up for doing much, but there was one thing I could cross off the to-do list. Summon a dead bank robber. This has been part two of the Spirit Walker, Tessa Lamar novels, book four. Written by Catherine M. Hurst. Narrated by Holly Adams. If you enjoyed this audiobook, Please subscribe to Catherine's channel where you can find part 3 of The Spirit Walker, along with more of Catherine's paranormal and contemporary romance novels.